My friends, it is good to be in the house of the Lord, isn't it? Amen. Especially when the heat is running. <laughs> feels good. It feels good. What an interesting week with the snow and things going up and down. But it is good to be able to have the capstone of the week be here in the Lord's house on the Lord's day. As you're coming in, we, many of us probably went right by it. Um, we have our bulletins. You were probably handed by one of our greeters. But also there's right on the offering uh, box stands, there's a survey that would be very, very helpful for the nominating committee. So if you would grab one, you can put it into the offering box back there or hand it to me, and we would love to have your input. So uh, just please keep that in mind. We're looking at setting the course for uh, the next two years, and I cannot underscore how much we need the Lord's guidance. We need the Lord's guidance. That we put the right people in the right position for the right reason at the right time. So we need that. And, and we're praying that God will lead in this whole process. We don't want to overburden anybody. We don't want to overlook anybody. So this is the moment to say, hey, it's a large enough church where people can get kind of lost and say, hey, I'd like to, I'm willing to help in this capacity. So we need that communicated. So please take a moment to fill that out. It would be very, very helpful. So it is good to be here, my friends. And we're going to pause for a moment for as we enjoyed our prelude. And as we do, may our minds and our hearts be focused in on the goodness and the glory and the grace of God.
Praise God. Praise God. I invite you to turn with me to our responsive reading. And this is in the back of your hymnals. Um, it is reading number 839, Spiritual Wisdom. <clears throat> and I will read the light print and please uh, read the bold print. Reading number 839, Spiritual Wisdom. We speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him. Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. These things we also speak not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But he who is spiritual judges all things, Yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? Amen. I invite you to bow your heads with me as we pray for our invocation. Almighty God, as we stand in awe of your goodness and mercy today, we invite you to be present amongst us by the power of your Holy Spirit. Father, we declare that we love you. Thank you that you have made the way of love known through your Son, Jesus Christ. We pray that you would reveal his great love to us all today as we gather to worship. Lead us by your spirit to praise you. May our hearts overflow with thanksgiving and our mouths proclaim your everlasting greatness. In the wonderful name of Jesus we pray. Let everyone say, Amen. Amen. Opening hymn is hymn number 520, He Hideth My Soul. Please stand.
And if anybody knows, I normally don't show up in a robe, so this has to do with the children's story, and it's really hot. So if we could get all the children to come up and please collect those uh, dollars and five dollars and tens, come on up. Good morning, everyone. How is everyone? Yeah? Praise God. Um, does it look like I showed up to come to church today? No? What's going on with my outfit? What's going on with my outfit, Adrian? Uh, you're wearing the wrong clothes. But I'm clothed, so I shouldn't wear this. So don't, I didn't come dressed today for church, is what you're saying? So I should probably get dressed? Okay, I'm gonna get dressed. So I guess the robe is not what I'm supposed to wear. Bear with me, I had to wear a certain outfit today. All right, so I'm gonna put on a different thing. Emma, can you hold that for me? Is that better? Am I fully dressed for church today? I am? Wait, my shoes? Oh, now you're really going to see my socks. Hold on. I don't have socks on. I love cows. <laughs> and it says move mountains. <laughs> I, like, I love these socks. Can you tell? Can you guess what my favorite color is? I think the robe. Am I dressed now? No, but they're really cool socks, right? I got a good sock game today. Okay, hold on. <laughs> Is this better? Do you think I'm fully dressed now? What happened? I don't have a hat. I'm sorry. I, it took a long time to do this hairstyle today. I have a watch. It says faith over fear and created with a purpose. A diamond one? I got to talk to my husband. <laughs> I have a scarf, but I'm really hot because that robe was really, really hot. Do you think I'm fully dressed? Do you think I look better than what I did? Emma, am I fully dressed though? Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Emma said no, so what am I missing? Did you catch it? Did anybody in the audience catch it? What am I missing? Ready? What do you got? The armor of God. Yeah, I totally forgot to put on the full armor of God today. Did you put on your full armor of God? You did? Did you do it? I don't know. Can we do it again? 
So do you think we could maybe read another scripture, Emma? For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of his world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. All right, but we're not done. So could you all stand up? We're all going to face Emma here. We need to stand up because I don't think we're all fully dressed for church. Do we think we should have our entire congregation stand up too? Maybe we should. What do you think? Should they stand up too? Yes. We're hearing a yes. I think everybody in here has to do this as well. So it's a very active children's story today. Go ahead, Emma. Stand therefore having your loins girt with about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. What do we have to put on? We have to put on our belt. Put on our belt. Put on our breastplates, right? Put on our breastplates. And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. We gotta take care of our feet. Put on our feet for the gospel of peace, right? Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of, wi- of the wicked. We got to put on our shields. Check. And our sword. Get our sword. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. All right, let's put on our helmet. Put in our sword. Praying always, praying always with, oh my goodness, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching there unto, unto with all preservance and supplication for all saints. Amen. Can we all sit? And I'm going to explain why we're going to do that story. So now are we fully dressed for church today? Are we fully dressed for today if it's not even just church? So the reason why, I was very excited because I've got a lot going on in my life, and those that are close to me know that i got a lot going on. And so I was, I've, been, I've been on the struggle bus train for a little bit, um, and that's okay because God's with me. <laughs> but one day, one morning, I was sitting there and I was getting ready. So I'm a high school teacher. I teach the big kids. I teach psychology and sociology and AP psychology and whatever else they make me teach. So I was getting ready and something happened and I didn't know what I was going to do. And I was sitting there in the morning and God was like, you're not dressed, Mandy. And I was like, what are you talking about? I've got everything I'm supposed to have on, Lord. He was like, no, I need you to put on the full armor of God today. And so I opened up my Bible, and I read Ephesians 6, and I was like, gotcha. Okay, God. So I put on the full armor of God, and I went to my daughter. I was like, Alexis, you got to put on the full armor today. And my husband, hopefully, well, he's going to listen, but he he doesn't know he's an Adventist yet, but he will be. Um, Praise God. I've already claimed the victory there. Um, So I go to my husband, Omar. I was like, you're going to need the full armor of God today. And I was like, I need you to read Ephesians 6 today, and I need you to put it on. And he was like, oh, okay. And I was like, God told me, you got to do it. And he was like, okay. Um, so that day, it was, gonna be, it was a tough day. And the next day was pretty tough. But you know what? I didn't walk out without the full armor of God, and I was 100% protected. Wasn't pr- like There were still arrows that got thrown, and there were things that were said and done. But at the end of the day, I was good because God protected me with my full armor. And so what we need to realize is that when we leave each day, don't forget to be fully dressed. What does that mean, to be what? Fully dressed in? The armor of God. Yes, so don't forget to not be fully dressed, okay? So open up your your Bibles and open it up to Ephesians 6. 
10 to 18 and then make sure that you're like, wait, what was that helmet for? It was for salvation. What was that spirit? What was the sword of the spirit for, right? So make sure you put on your armor. And even if you're going to have a good day, which that's a great thing too, don't leave your home without it. Is that okay? Is that a good lesson for today? Don't worry, I don't plan on wearing that robe again. It was really hot. So can someone pray for us? Thanks, bud. Dear Jesus, thank you for this day. Thank you for our family. Thank you for everyone that is here. And thank you for that God is always with us and that he will be with us always. And he will never leave us because he is the only one that we trust and obey. Because we like him in the name, amen. Love a children's prayer. All right, go ahead and go back to your seats. Nice job. So this Thursday is exciting. We're going to have a kids' health program. And if you haven't already signed up, you can invite neighbors. This is for anybody and everybody who has kids. We're going to have a lot of food samples for kids for healthy snacks. And uh, it starts at 6, and we have a supper as well. And... A lot of interesting things to cover. At the end of the month, April 28, Women's Ministry is doing a craft swap, and it's going to be at the Sterling Old um, 1885 building on Main Street in Sterling. For uh, if you have crafts that you never don't use anymore or whatever, we've already got 19 applicants, so there's a place to register. Um, We'll put it in the bulletin next week again, but just keep that in mind as well. And our planning for Choose Wellness has to be started very shortly. September 22 is the date, and it's going to be held at Sterling Clearview Farm. I'm very excited about that, and I need some volunteers. So if anybody can volunteer to help reach out to vendors, to help do the marketing, to help do, um, there's a lot of things that have to, have to go on before you get a thing like that going. So please keep all those things in mind. Thank you. So many of you are aware that uh, somebody who has been part of this community for a long, long time passed away this week. Linda Hoopman did pass away. We've been praying for a long time, and uh, I'm going to read the announcement from Roger and from his family, for those who don't have a bulletin, and I like the way he, he framed all this. He said, uh, Linda fell asleep in Jesus' arms Wednesday night, April 3, after a three-year battle with cancer. We are so grateful for the text, emails, messages, cards, foods, flowers and overwhelming support, and especially for those prayers that have carried our family through these past few years. We are very much looking forward to that one day very soon when Jesus will come to wipe every tear from our eyes and take us home to be with him forever. The date and time for Linda's celebration of life are yet to be determined, but keep Roger and their family in our prayers. So Linda was very integrated. She was heavily involved with SLA, ran the ski program for many years, and she will be missed. But we will see her again, right? Amen. We will see. This is the blessed hope. We will see her again. So I want to just sort of shift gears for a moment and say something you've probably never heard from the pulpit. Let's go to the movies. <laughs> Uh, we're going to, the Hope Channel has done something very, very innovative and, and very, very uh, progressive. They've produced a 100-minute movie, Hollywood quality, of the Adventist history. And it's going to be showing at the Solomon Pond Movie Theater in two, well, on the 17th and the 18th. And we're looking to bring a group there, capitalize on group rate, a little bit of a discount, so go to our church website, put your name on the list. Probably the tickets, we, I'll probably buy them that Monday, but the group rates, if you don't get in on the group rate, you'll have to buy your own at the, at the door. And it's just a dollar more, but it's a little bit of a savings. So uh, what I want to do is, is 
uh, I talked with our treasurer and what we're going to do to make this easiest and hopefully this works in your stewardship, uh, be a little bit more generous with the social fund, okay? That's, we're going to put it like that, the social fund when you're online giving. So the social fund, it may make it make itself clear. So that's going to make it easier for everybody. And we're going to by and large meet there, but um, for those who want to, maybe you want to offer a ride or need a ride, that's an option on the website. Invite a friend. Invite a friend. Bring a friend, exactly. Um, continue with our um, ministry matters. So South Lancaster Academy, April 8th through the 12th, will be having a week, an academy week of prayer. And uh, one of the things um, they will be needing will be drivers, um, to assist and chaperone. So if you, um, this is in our bulletin here, if you uh, want to come out and support them, they'll be having this week of prayer again. This is going to be, so this is next week. This is next week, the 8th through the 12th. Um, please support us, South Lancaster Academy. Um, the focus of this particular week of prayer is on evangelism. This is significant because I don't look at those of us who are taking part in ministry and leading out as the ones who are really going to take evangelism forward in the 21st century. I look at the young people that I see every day or I see on the Sabbath, and I look at you folks evangelizing and reaching out to the world. So definitely um, take note of this one um, and be supportive of South Lancaster Academy as they move forward with this, uh, this ministry. And then finally, um, Illuminaire Vespers. The Illuminaire Vespers will be having a concert this is on the uh, 13th of April, and um, if you like sacred music, and you like music that takes you along on a spiritual journey, our very own um, Miss uh, Katie, um, she's also one of the professors down here at the academy. She will be leading the, um, the choir um, in this musical uh, performance. So come out, take note of this, support it. Again, our young people leading forward in ministry and the ministry of music. God bless you all. So now it's time in the service for us to come in prayer. So please stand as we uh, sing our prayer song. Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you for bringing us to another restful, blessed Sabbath day. You give so much to us that we don't even realize and definitely don't deserve. Please forgive us of our sins, both the intentional ones and unintentional, and change the desires of our hearts. Lord, each one of us has concerns, praises, and requests. We've lost loved ones. We know someone. We may have ourselves health concerns, stresses and burdens due to this unstable and divided society. Finances may be tight or they may be ruling us. God, may we seek your comfort, your unfailing love. May we find our identity in you 
our creator, redeemer, our friend, our Lord. As we move forward in this service, in this Sabbath day, we pray for your spirit to fill our hearts and minds, that you will be present with us. Be with the pastor as he speaks, and be with us as we go through this upcoming week. Bring us safely to another Sabbath. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Once Jesus was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God was coming, and he answered, The kingdom of God is not coming with things that can be observed, nor will they say, Look, here it is, or there it is, for in fact the kingdom of God is among you.
have some good news to share with you. Moses texted me this morning that Mary Monroe is home and she is welcome. She's welcoming visitors. So please, if you're free, drop by and see her. And I know she is, Moses was certain to make sure we knew that she is watching us right now. So Mary, we are with you in spirit and we know that you are here with us in spirit. So I invite you to pray with me. Lord, we all live on the same planet. We all are faced with the same dynamics, the same kingdoms, as it were. And so, Lord, as we find ourselves with a home in heaven and a home on this earth, help us, Lord, to sort it all out, to see what does that mean? What does it look like? What would be pleasing in your eyes? Lord, be with us as we spend a few moments immersed in your words. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Came across the story <clears throat> of two friends who went out to lunch together at a restaurant. They each requested the same dish, filet of sole. After a few moments, the, the server came out and there were two pieces of fish, one large and one small, on one plate. One of the men took the plate, served his friend, and he paced, put the small piece on a plate and handed it across the table. His friend said, well, you certainly have nerve. The man who just gave the fish over says, well, what's troubling you? He says, look at what you've done. You've given me the little piece and kept the big one for yourself. Well, how would you have done it? He said, well, if I were serving, I would have given you the bigger piece. And the man smiled and said, well, I've got it, don't I? <laughs> At this, they both did laugh. It had a happy ending. But we live in a kingdom of power, of me first, of control. And Jesus introduces this whole other kingdom called the kingdom of heaven. What are we to make of the kingdom of heaven? He uses it a lot of times. In Matthew, he uses it four times. Mark, 14 times. In Luke, he uses it 32 times. And in John, he uses it just twice. So let's take a moment and just put our toe in the water for a moment as we look at this subject, the kingdom of heaven, and we're going to keep looking at this throughout the year. And turn with me in your Bibles to uh, uh, Luke chapter 17, beginning with verse, with verse 20. And to provide a little context, the year is 31 AD. The crucifixion is less than six months away. Jesus is actually on his way to Jerusalem, but he's going through the area of, of Perea. Now, Perea is not a desirable zip code. That's very important. It's not a desirable zip code. It's somewhere between the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea, and, and it's on the eastern side of the Jordan River. It's very important to kind of keep that in mind. And so with that, Jesus is there, and it says here on verse 20 of Luke 17, once on being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied, the coming of the kingdom of God is not something that can be observed. Nor will people say here it is or there it is because the kingdom of God is in your midst. Now that, my friends, is a question that we've all asked. When will you come? When will you come, Lord? And, and it's interesting because it goes from, from this to another question because if you jump down to the end in verse 37, they actually take it a step further and they says, where, Lord? Where? They want to know where and when is this going to happen? And dare I propose this morning that they are asking the wrong question. They're asking the where and the when, but they never ask the how and the why. You see, my friends, Jesus didn't come to give us eternal life. 
Jesus came to give us life that happens to be eternal. You understand what I'm saying? Jesus said in John 10, 10, that the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. That is, this starts today. This moment, right here, this moment. And it's important to note that when you look at Revelation, now John is the one who wrote this, John 10, 10. He also writes Revelation. So when he sees a vision in heaven, he sees the book of life, right? The names are written in the Lamb books of life. It doesn't say the Lamb's, or it doesn't say the book of the saved. It says your name is in the book of life, not the book of the saved. Now, you may say, oh, pastor, where are you going with all this? Well, it, it, it's interesting because we sometimes re need to reframe the way we see things. So Jesus says, Jesus says here, um, and by the way, postscript, Look at the very ending of verse 37. He replied, where there is a dead body, there the vultures will gather. Now, I want to let you know that Stephen King had nothing to do with this sermon. All right, nothing to do with it. Jesus, I believe, is taking a jab at the Pharisees. I think Jesus is sending a missile across their bow. He's saying, wait a second, you know what? This religion thing can get so bad, so twisted, so misunderstood that it could be compared to a dead body with vultures on it, both of which are unclean. Can you picture this in your mind? It's ugly to think about this. But he's saying that religion can become like this. It could be lifeless at its core. It could be dead. It could be meaningless. It could be pointless. Yet there are those who are there who are feeding off of it. And I would almost dare to say by implication, he's saying, Mr. Pharisee, you're the vulture. This is kind of heavy stuff. This is heavy stuff. Now, religious systems, my friends, we have to be careful of. They can deteriorate. They can deteriorate. And I'm going to tell you, this is the year 2024, right? 180 years ago, 180 years ago, the Millerites, that's going to be in the film, Jesus is coming. October 22, right? 1844, and we know our brothers and sisters in Christ up there in up to state New York, they went out to a place called Ascension Rock. We almost have a what or a when and a where moment in our own history. And it's as if Jesus is saying, now wait a second here. What about the how and the why? So this is where it gets amazing because in verse 21, Jesus says, uh, let's read 20 to 21. The coming of the kingdom of God is not something that can be observed, nor will people say, here it is or there it is, because the kingdom of God is in your midst. It is here now. It is here right now. Somewhere on the eastern bank of the Jordan River, which actually would be Jordan now, Sandwiched between the Dead Sea and the Sea of Galilee, Jesus said the kingdom of God is right here, right now. So should we all get on a plane and go there right now to Jordan and say, well, this is where the kingdom of God is. Is that what he's saying? Not at all. Not at all. And, and just to make matters more complicated for the listener, they, back in the first century, they're talking, they were miles and miles and miles from the epicenter of religiosity from Jerusalem. They're miles from that, which of course, well, that would be a good spot for the kingdom if you're wanting religious influence. Oh, but if you want political power, well, then you're thousands of miles from Rome. So he's setting up a new system here, a whole new kingdom. So what is this kingdom thing about? Well, one term that has been used over the years is rulership. The rulership of God. Well, that kind of comes with a lot of baggage and misunderstanding. And, and, and when you 
try to sift through all the times that Jesus uses the expression, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven, you see that it's a whole lot more richer and complex than that. I mean, there's the parable of the great banquet. Jesus compares the kingdom of heaven like a mustard seed, like leaven, uh, like a party, like somebody having a party. All of these metaphors are being used to describe the kingdom of heaven. And never once does Jesus say, this is, the def- this is the definition of the kingdom of heaven. Never once. He gives all these clues. And to be honest with you, I'm glad that's the way he does it. Because he's making us think on our knees. He's making us process this. Now, there have been theologians who have wrestled with this. And I came across a th- theologian named Jürgen Moltmann. And he brings up some interesting points. When you go through all of the metaphors of the, of the kingdom of heaven, you'll see there's a seed, there's a, the metaphor of the seed, the sower, the mustard seed. And what are these things? When you, sit, when you hear those words, seed, sower, mustard seed, you begin to think growth, right? You begin to think beginnings. You begin to think life. You begin to think hope. And many of the parables happen in the spring, and the summer, but none of those happen in the winter and the fall. That's interesting. And then, of course, you have the metaphor of the great party, and all these go on and on, and Jürgen Moltmann says, you know what? The kingdom of God can really be described in one word, recreation. Recreation. You see, my friends, when God shows up, he is either going to create or recreate. Do you see what I'm saying? God spent six days speaking. And what does he do? He creates. On the seventh day, he's silent. That is our turn to speak in response to what he's done. Jesus shows up at a funeral. What happens? The dead come to life. The person who was blind can now see. The person with leprosy is clean. This is what happens over and over and over again. He's creating and he's recreating. And he's saying, this is in your midst. So let's reread this here for a moment. The coming of the kingdom, I'm sorry, the coming of recreation is not something that can be observed, nor will people say, here it is or there it is, because the recreation is in your midst. Wow. Does he mean what I think he means? Do you mean to say that we can actually have an influence on each other? That we can do that? You see, my friends, the kingdom of heaven is still already here. (laughs) It's already here. It's here in the sanctuary. It's in our fellowship hall. Friday night we had the agape supper. The kingdom of God was there. The kingdom of God is in the youth chapel. The four are downstairs, upstairs. The kingdom of God is in the kitchen. The kingdom of God is even in your car. The kingdom of God is wherever two or three are gathered in the name of Jesus Christ. Something happens when we come together. Something happens when we extend a blessing to others and we receive a blessing from others. Something happens. Now, Roger Prather shared with me an article this week about, uh, about the exodus that's going on uh, of all churches and why are people leaving. The author's name is Derek Thompson, and he says, he says, I'm an atheist, or ag- agnostic, because of something agnostic. He was raised practicing both uh, Hanukkah and Santa Claus, so kind of put him in a different, different frame of mind. But he kind of looked at the decline of religion as an agnostic. He looked at the decline of religion in people's lives as a positive thing. He sees organized religion mostly as a a world entangled by scandals and noxious politics, his words. So he said, what is there really to mourn? But then he has an epiphany. He said, maybe, and I quote, maybe religion, for all its faults, works a bit like a retaining wall to hold back the destabilizing pressure of American hyper-individualism, which threatens to swell and spill over in its absence. Did you catch that? Hyper-individualism. 
What is Jesus saying here when he's looking at the crowd? The kingdom of heaven is your midst, in your midst, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of it. Something happens when we come together and we call on the name of Jesus Christ, my friends. Something happens. He goes on to say, America just didn't lose its religion without finding a replacement. No, 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 no. What we did, we fell in love with the smart home. And it says, it's like staring in a piece of glass. He quotes from another author. He says, we become disembodied from our bodies, float placelessly in a constant cosmos, and, are, and, and we, we, we just go from image to image to image. And the result is we become disembodied, asynchronous, shallow, and solitary. Amen. Thank you, Mitchell. Thank you. This is it. Disembodied, asynchronous, shallow, and solitary. He goes on to say, religious rituals are the opposite in almost every respect. Do you see the answer here? Religious rituals are the opposite in almost every respect. And the result is we become embodied, synchronous, deep, and we do become collective. Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is in your midst. It's there. Do we see it? Do we embrace it? Do we hug it? Do we, do we celebrate it? And you see, here's where things get interesting because Jesus is going to give some metaphors here and parables about what, how most people live life. So let's look at verse 22. It says over there that Jesus is speaking to the sin. Now he's looking at the disciples. The time is coming when you, will know, when you will long to see the days of the Son of Man, but you will not see it. People will tell you, there he is, or there he is, here he is there. Go, uh, do not go running off after them. For the Son of Man in his day will be like lightning which flashes from, and lights up the sky from one end to another. But first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. Now, there's a lot there. Two words there that stand out off the page. Suffering and rejection. Suffering and rejection. Now, here's where things get interesting. Suffering and rejection. We all avoid them, don't we? We avoid them. But they are unavoidable, my friends. They are unavoidable. If you and I refuse the risk of rejection and suffering... We will not progress. Do you see what I'm saying? We will not progress. We must risk rejection. We must risk suffering. And you see, the thing is, 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 is if, if I remain by myself, if I say, I'm not going to take that chance of, of rejection, I'm not going to take the risk of suffering, you know what will happen to me? I will not change. I will not grow. I won't change. As a matter of fact, there's a tribe in Central Asia that, that understands this, this, this paralyzed status that if they're going to put a curse on anybody, do you know what they say? May you stay in one place forever. Isn't that true? May you stay in one place. That, that, instead of saying the other euphemisms we have in our culture, may you stay in one place forever. There's an, there's an idea that we must move on. And this is the mentality of heaven. The incarnation, <laughs> risk and suffering, the crucifixion, the resurrection, all went through because of the fact that, yes, he was going to face rejection and suffering. And this is where we struggle. Do I dare get out of my bubble? Do I dare take off the bubble wrap off of me? Do I dare be a human being with other people? And so he points out in verse 26 down through 28 to 29 where we are in today's world. Look at what this says in 26. By the way, this, Jesus is listing 10 good things. These are not bad things. These are good things. Just as it was the day of Noah, so were the days of the Son of Man. People were eating. We need to, we need to drink. We need to eat. We're marrying, that's God made marriage. Be given in marriage. Yes, to the day Noah entered the ark. Then the flood came and destroyed them all. 
It was the same in the days of Lot. People were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. This is all fine stuff, right? Nothing wrong with that. The day of the Lot, the day Lot left Sodom, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. I really like what Tim Keller calls sin. Sin isn't only doing bad things, it is turning good things into ultimate things. Did you catch that? It is turning good things into ultimate things. Building, great. Buying and selling, that's fine. Eating, great. But it's turning that into an ultimate thing. And that's where, the thing, where things go wrong. You see, in the time of Noah, nobody noticed, hey, there's a guy over there, he's building a boat. This is kind of strange, and if anything, they teased him for it. Then there was this situation in Sodom where they're all so self-absorbed. A visitor comes in, two visitors come in, and nobody notices him except for Lot. Lot is the only one who notices him and extends hospitality. When the sun sets, it gets pretty ugly. And all the people of the town come out and they have dehumanized the visitors. And they want to get out of the other people what they want to get out. Same thing with Noah. They're so self-absorbed. They're so self-absorbed with the eating and the drinking and all these things are fine and dandy. But they have lost the big picture. They don't see the ark over there. They don't see a man saying, wait a second here, this is not good what we're doing. Same thing with Lot, with, the, with Sodom and, and Sodom. And so this is where we really need each other, my friends, to say, you know what? Are we keeping, are we walking forward arm in arm? Are we encouraging each other? Are we even challenging each other? So Jesus tells this story that, that yeah, this, this, as he said, sin is good things becoming ultimate things. My friends, that can happen to me. It can happen to any one of us. It can, we can be defined by our careers. There'll be pastors, my friends, who won't be saved because their identity was their being a pastor. And you can preach the gospel for 30, 40 years and never apply it to your own life. You see what I'm saying? And so Jesus understands this. And it says in verse 30, just as it was like, just as it will be just like this on the day the Son of Man is revealed, on that day no one who is in the house top with possessions inside should go down and get them. Likewise, no one, no one in the field should go back for anything. Remember Lot's wife. Let's pause it for one second. All scholars say this is pretty much Jesus referring to the fall of Jerusalem. You know, don't go back. And what's important is when they leave Jerusalem, they're supposed to do so in a walk of faith. They're not supposed to go back and get their stuff. <laughs> they're supposed to literally walk forward in faith. Here's where he comes to the point. Whoever wants, whoever tries to keep their life will lose it. And whoever loses their life will preserve it. I tell you that on that night, Two people will be in one bed. One will be taken, another will be left. Two women will be grinding grain together, and one will be taken, another left. So the question is, my friends, what is life? What is life? Is it a muscle in our heart, in our chest cavity, pumping blood through the system? Is it simply brain waves? What is it? There was an author I enjoyed reading years ago, his name was Richard Carlson. And maybe you remember the book that was probably made of the most famous was Don't Sweat the Small Stuff and It's All Small Stuff. Remember that? Well, I remember a story in there that he told about he bought a brand new car. And the first thing he did with his brand new car is he got, I believe it was a can of soda. And he poured the soda on the back seat of the car. Intentionally poured it on there. And, and, and he, you know, he let it sink in a little bit. Then he, I guess he probably cleaned up the excess liquid. And so why did you do that, Richard Carlson? Why did you do that? He said, well, the answer is very simple. I have, I believe it was two wonderful nieces, and sometimes they're going to be in the backseat of the car, 
and they're going to spill a milkshake or spill a soda, and I don't want them to feel bad <laughs> for being the first ones who put the stain on the seat. Now, I'm telling you that story because later on, after he wrote the book, he was on a flight going, I believe, from San Francisco to New York promoting another book he was making, had written, and in flight, he died. He died. Now, I put these two together because now when we hear the name Richard Carlson, many of you never heard that story before, you will think, aha, uh -huh, sad loss. But there was a man who valued people over possessions. He was a blessing to other people. He didn't see, he didn't dehumanize people. He lifted them up. And he understood that, he understood that. And so it's, it's, we live in a world where, I hate to say it, but some of we reverse those two things. We put possessions over people. And so Jesus is saying, look, if you try to keep your life, you're going to lose it. And whoever loses their life will in fact preserve it or will find it. I want to wrap up with a story about a woman named Sarah Miles who had a very interesting experience. Sarah was pretty much had no God in her life. No God. She was living a lifestyle probably we wouldn't approve of. And one day, out of the blue, she walks into a church and receives communion. Out of the blue. She just decides to do that. Do you know what happens? Her life was totally transformed totally transformed by receiving that wafer and receiving the blessing. Totally changed. Now, what did she end up doing? Ah, her life got more complicated. Her life got more complicated and more adventurous. She actually got involved with, I don't know if that was that church or another church, and, and one day they were having communion and, and she realized something, you know, some of the people that I'm around, I love them, but I don't really like them. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And he, he, she talks about there's the deacon over there with the clenched jaw. And then there's the, there's the, the check, check out person there at Walgreens. And there's the atheist yuppie. And, and, and there's the, the woman with the annoying nasal wine, the self-righteous homophobic radio evangelist, the conservative African bishop. And he, she began thinking about these people she didn't like. And she realized, wait a second, I cannot get by and think that I myself am loved by God and they are not. And she wrote these words, I was going to get communion, whether I wanted it or not, with people I didn't necessarily like, people I didn't choose. She says, conversion is a process and it keeps happening. The cycles of acceptance and rejection or resistance, epiphany and doubt. And she wrestled with this whole concept, and, and now we're in the, into this kind of deep, but she wrestles with this concept about accepting Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. And she says, you know what? In her point of view, does this become a form of idolatry? Now, if you've been tracking with me here, you kind of know where I'm going with this, but if you just tuned in, you just, I just said some heresy, okay? Because it's true. We accept Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior. You know, John 3, 16, we know it. But she said, wait a second, that can become sort of like a good luck charm. Oh, yeah, I did that back in 1975. I'm good. I'm good. And so she goes so far to say she had this dreadful realization about Christianity. This is something to think about. I'm still thinking about it myself. You can't be a Christian by yourself. That's something to think about. You can't be a Christian by yourself. What is she saying here? My friends, we need each other. We need each other. We need that moment when we reach out and bless somebody and receive a blessing. We need that moment when we encourage you that we say, I thank God for you. We need that. And in that process, 
something happens. Oh, Jesus shows up. Jesus shows up. That's what happens. And it's even interesting that even in Ellen White in Desire of Ages, page 506, she says, six, she says the kingdom of God begins in the heart. Yeah. It begins where? Not in the Middle East. Not outside Jerusalem. Not in, not in, it begins right in my heart. And that's where, what we're trying to see here. Jesus is spelling it out. Hey, wait a second. You think it's about it's when and where. Uh-uh. It's more about the how and the why. The how and the why. I'm going to add one more story as we wrap up here. A story told about a, a therapist who was working with a patient for many, many years. She um, was depressed, depressed, depressed. Years and years of this. The therapist was really at his wit's end, didn't know what to do. So then he said one day he had an idea. He had an idea. He said, next time you come, we're going to go on a field trip. And so the woman got to the office, they get in the car, they go down, they go down to a hospital, go up into one of the rooms. They spend 30 minutes visiting somebody, visiting somebody. Time of, you know, there's a one hour window there, so they leave, get in the car. And the therapist looks at his patient and says, How do you feel now? And she said, I feel wonderful. I feel wonderful. But then she said, But you don't expect me to do that every day, do you? <laughs> I think. That was the point. That was the point. Let us, my friends, do that every single day. And as we do that, you know who will show up? Jesus will show up. Jesus will show up. Please stand. Thank you.
do love those words, bound to him eternally by love's strong cord. I invite you to pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we are brothers and sisters in Christ. We eat at the same table. We serve the same Lord. We're saved by the same grace. And Lord, I pray that as we embody that, as we live it in our lives, that we will see that, hey, you show up. When we, when we show up in the name of Jesus with just one or two people, something amazing happens. Oh, Lord, may those moments be sacred, whether they be here in the fellowship hall, the sanctuary, in the car, in the classroom, in the office, in the home. May those be sacred moments. When, yes, when we have come together as two humble human beings serving the same Lord, you are in the midst of us. The kingdom of heaven is present. We pray this in the saving name of Jesus Christ. Amen.